Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Stephanie Gray, and this is a daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Kicking off the show, we have Christian Harloff. What's up, guys? Oh, and hey, how about Stephanie? Round of applause for Stephanie yeah. coming on a movie talk first time. And you guys, welcome to the best damn related movie show on the damn internet. I'm me, you're you. What do we got today, Stephanie? Uh, well, we also have... Jeremy, John. John, yeah, on that's the show. me. Uh, I, I love the fact that that was damn good, Christian. You're a damn good dude. I love that damn shirt. Thank Let's you. do some damn movie stuff. That's my camera. Yes. I'm used to looking over there. Hi. Hi, camera. <laughs> and we have Perry Nemroff. Oh, hi, guys. Just to keep this going, where's my camera? I don't think either of you looked at the right camera, but no, hey, there's mine. I jibbed it up. And then it is Cody, a really yeah. cool jib. Yeah, I just want to see Cody's head shake back and forth like this <laughs> when, when we all miss our cues. Headphones. Yeah. And finally, who do we got? And finally, we have Clark Wolf. Oh, hello, everyone. Thank you guys for having me. And thank you, Cody, for keeping up with all of us back there. <laughs> all right. So, look, things happen. News breaks that we don't have in the show notes. And one of those things happened. A new trailer dropped today for Jumanji. Stephanie, you can you tell us a little bit about that today? I sure can. All right, Sony has released the first Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle trailer. The film centers on four high schoolers who, during their time in detention, come across the ancient, powerful game Jumanji and are sucked into the game world. Once there, they take on the appearance of avatars, played by Dwayne Johnson, Kevin Hart, Karen Gillan, and Jack Black. The movie's directed by Jake Kasdan, with a release date set for later this year on December 22nd. Christian! What did you think about the first trailer for Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle? Stephanie, I liked it. I liked I, I did. I liked this trailer. I'm not look, Jake Kasdan did Sex Tape, I think it was the last mm -hmm. one he did. Didn't really like that movie too much. Um, and I still I'm rooting for him. He's got a good lineage. Uh, but there's this particular movie when they announced Jumanji, I was like, oh no, are they just gonna remake the film? What are they gonna do here? Is it just gonna be pretty much the same thing we've seen before? And they're giving it a different spin. They're putting it in the video game world and and it's almost like um, with click. Is that what it, it reminded me of that a little bit too? You throw that in there. I like the way that I thought that you know you're gonna have the kids from behind, the, and then the characters like The Rock would just be doing the normal thing that The Rock does. But the fact that he's actually this kid talking like him, that the, all the avatars. I like the spin with Jack Black that he's actually it's a girl that's that's using him as the avatar. This could be a lot of fun. I think it's a good time to put it out at the holiday season. Um, so I don't know. It could be an absolute disaster when it comes out. But I think for what it's doing, what it's trying to get, and to not have like, oh, just another Jumanji remake, because it's not really a remake. It's just really taking the premise of Jumanji itself and throwing it into a video game. And I think that could be a lot of fun. And it could potentially be the first good video game movie uh, that we've ever gotten. I, I understand. It's not. I mean, you could also include Wreck-It Ralph in there if you're going to include this. But... Anyway, I, I really dug what I saw, but Clark, you saw it also. What'd you think? Yeah, I, I ended up really liking it. Now, I am a 90s kid, so mm. of course I had the book, uh, the picture book, and I also you know saw the movie when it first came out. So there was part of me that was a little hesitant that it was now a video game, and I kind of became like an old lady shaking her fist, right. like, what do you mean? It's board, kids play board games? Um, but aside from that, the trailer made me laugh. It actually made me laugh, and I have mm. to say, as much as I love The Rock, and I do love The Rock, a lot of his, uh, the last couple of movies that he's been in have kind of not really been my thing or, or haven't really uh, driven me to come into the theater. But this one I thought looked great. And Kevin Hart, hilarious. I love Jack Black. And I love the concept of him being a teenage girl. That is, <laughs> Jack Black is already endlessly funny to me, but the fact that he's playing a vapid teenage girl is hilarious. So yeah. this, this was a big win for me jeremy johns yeah i laughed in the trailer too like what's a trailer like this is just supposed to make you laugh if it makes me laugh or entertains me i i'm totally on board with it i love the fact that it's the the ancient game jumanji in a video game i don't know how that happens i don't know right. how this ancient game became a video game but you really get sucked into the fact that it's pretty much like tron from hell where it's right, like they, right. they, they get sucked into this thing now they're there i love the fact that uh, the rock stole han solo's belt apparently that's great <laughs> and i just couldn't help but chuckle at the fact that I think it was Jack Black who was running, and he was like, why am I running so slow? Because nothing's worse in a video game than you pick a character, and you're like, oh, I picked the slow one. Damn it. You know? So, I mean, they had good video game moments that gamers will get uh, with, the, with the vibe and uh, tone tale of Jumanji. So I think it's an interesting thing 
that the trailer did well. So I like the trailer. Perry. I am a big fan of this trailer. I'm a big fan of the original, too. I watched that movie over and over and over. I still watch it every once in a while when I catch it on TV. I thought I was going to be a little more sensitive to the idea of them turning the board game into a video game where, I mean, it almost could have been like, call it anything. Like, it doesn't matter if it's Jumanji or not. Mm. However... I have a feeling that this is only the teaser trailer, and eventually when we get more trailers and when we get the feature film, there's going to be some interesting little connections. And I was also thinking initially that this idea could grow tired very quickly because, you know, the kids become these avatars, and, and that's it, and they go on their adventure. But with the running thing, and I really every little element that I saw in this trailer, it makes me think that you could actually sustain a full feature on this. And this cast, I really don't think there's any better group of people to be about to be able to embody teenagers and make it absolutely hilarious. I think you're right, though. Also, playing off what you said with Tron, and if you look at it, it's almost like a superhero movie also, because when you look at them having these characters that have these abilities and powers, but they don't know how to use them, and then you see it as it develops, you see like they're using... They even say as much. We have powers. we got to figure out how to do it. And then you see the girl. She does kind of the flying kick. So if done correctly, this could be a surprise hit uh, going off of, you know, something that we're very familiar with. And not just money be making money because it's a holiday film, but making money because it's actually really good. Fingers crossed the chemistry between The Rock and Kevin Hart is pretty electric. And I love that The Rock started off when he landed with the, the eyebrow. people's eyebrow. Yeah. Amazing. All right, Stephanie, what's next? All right. Our first big story. Matt Reeves teases a noir detective version of the Batman. So listen to this. With War for the Planet of the Apes landing in theaters next month, director Matt Reeves has already started making the press rounds for the final chapter in the Apes trilogy. And because it's Batman, the director is already fielding questions about what we can expect to see from his version of The Dark Knight. Speaking with new trailer buzz, Reeves talked a bit about his take on the Batman, teasing something fans have wanted to hear for a very long time, a world's greatest detective angle that is noir-driven. And I think there's a quote. Yeah. You ready for it? Yeah, please. In all of my films, what I try to do in an almost Hitchcockian sense is use the camera and use the storytelling so that you become the character and you emphasize, emphasize, emph you know what I mean. Empathy, you get it. With that point of view, there's a chance to do an almost noir-driven detective version of Batman that is point of view driven in a very, very powerful way that hopefully is going to connect you to what's going on inside his head and inside his heart. Christian, back to you. Thoughts on Reeves exploring a detective angle finally in a noir-driven Batman? Well, I emphasize with you because that was a long quote. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, look, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Matt Reeves, and when when he was announced to direct Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, I was vocal. I was like, I don't know why you need to replace Rupert. I mean, the guy did such a great job, and then Dawn is it's the best it's the best of the series and he really understood what they were going for he is really good at developing characters understanding um the mythologies and he what he did in apes was the way he's kind of able to combine little things that happened thematically in the 1968 version things that he did so when you hear him talking about this property he's not a guy that just takes a job he locks in, he goes in, and I think that he probably did a lot of research too of what fans wanted to see for a very long time and his understanding of the things that worked in the past with Batman and things that you know people have always talked about how great of a detective Batman is. That's what he is. And the fact, I love the idea of a film noir detective Batman. That makes a lot of sense. That makes like, and it's also, if you're going to maybe bring it down and scale a little bit, if you can, I mean, it's always going to be large in nature, a Batman movie. I mean, it, it's Batman, it's Warner Brothers, it's part of the DCEU. But if you can make it seem small, if you can put a small movie in a big movie's body, you know, like that type of thing, he can do it. He can make it work. And I also think that this is encouraging for like someone like because Ben Affleck, you know, if he's if he can get really excited about the project, we don't know about what, what's happened in the past. And let's get the past is in the past. Maybe there's certain things that happened there that he just maybe wasn't vibing. Maybe now with this, he'll get a little bit more excited. Maybe maybe we'll start to see something different because they're gonna they're restructuring the whole DCEU after Wonder Woman. We're gonna see some things happen in, in um, Justice League. To have Matt Reeves doing this is a big encouragement, especially after seeing War of the Planet of the Apes. I'm on board, Jeremy. Yeah, I agree with you. When I first heard there was a noir Batman idea, I was like, like the black and white Logan movie? Like, are they going to make it black and white? They're probably not going to make it black and white, but I do want to see the world's greatest detective angle played up a bit with a director who can handle that kind of thing. I, I felt that we saw some of the detective elements 
in the dark night, you know, yeah. when you're shooting the bullets and the bricks, and he's like fingerprints, you know, and he's like getting the, <laughs> you know, he's getting the fingerprints off the bullets, you know. But it was never played up as much as Batman the animated mm-hmm. series. Like Batman the animated series, he was straight up the world's greatest detective. So if they can ultimately have Matt Reeves direct a Batman movie that is like Batman the animated series, which is what I'm piecing together in this. I think that'd be great. In fact, more detective-like than Batman the Animated Series if that's the angle they want to go, how every every movie needs an angle now. Like, how do you pitch this in the pitch room? Pitch right. it. Like, all right, so it's like Batman the Animated Series, but with film noir, he's the world's greatest detective. Think of Batman and the detective. You know, someone was like, brilliant, and it is pretty brilliant, so I want to see that. But, you know, Perry, Jeremy does bring up a point that you, you have to probably switch things up. How are we going to make this different? How are we going to set it apart? Do you think that Matt Reeves is part of that overall strategy? Do you think that Warner Brothers wanted to do that in the first place? What do you think overall? Well, one of the things that struck me about this quote is it's very similar to what Ben Affleck said last year when he was on set and he was still planning on directing this movie. And I think that's really encouraging that even though they had these shakeups, they still have that same core of an idea. Obviously, things could have changed, but it sounds like they were both going forward with the same type of idea in mind, which I think is awesome. But... Matt Reeves is, he is just an incredible resume. When you think about all the films that he's directed and how many are above a certain level, that that is a sign that you have a good guy here. And especially with the Planet of the Apes movies, because I felt the same way when he stepped in for for, uh, Dawn. Right. Because I loved Rise a lot. And then he took over for, for Rupert Wyatt, and it wasn't a situation where... It felt the same, but it also was in a situation where it felt different. He did exactly what he should have done for a sequel movie. He took what worked so well in the first one, and he pushed the story forward. And the idea of comparing Batman to Caesar is really perfect in this case, because I think especially in War, more so than any of the uh, Planet of the Apes, the new Planet of the Apes movies, you are so inside Caesar's head where you really understand what he's battling between in terms of how he should lead the apes and what is going to happen with the world in the future, and that's the kind of mentality and analytical thinking you need to be able to convey in any kind of detective movie, so it seems like the perfect coupling here. Uh, Clark, if I'm wrong, correct me, but I I think you've been championing Matt Reeves for a long time. Yes, yes. How do you feel about these comments? I love it. I love it. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that, because I was about to say, for those of you who used to watch AMC Movie Talk way back in the day, I've been a fan of Matt Reeves forever. I love, uh, well, not forever, but for a long time. I love Cloverfield. I Mm -hmm. love Let Me In. I love his Apes movies, and when he was announced to direct uh, the Batman, that's when I said, "Okay, DCEU, I'm 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 on board. I'm back." Yeah. Like because I have said before, I, I aside from Wonder Woman and Aquaman, I'm done with the e- DCEU. Like I'm not I'm not participating anymore. That being said, when they said, "Okay, Joss Whedon is coming to help coming in to help in with Justice League, and Matt Reeves is going to come in and take on the Batman, and Joss Whedon might also uh, make a Batgirl movie," I went, "Okay, I see the direction that they're taking this." And as far as him and a noir, uh, a noir and personal uh, take on the Batman character, it's brilliant. It's super, super smart, and it's smart for the DCEU to have somebody like Matt Reeves, who is a visionary and who does direct actors very, very well. I mean, you know, we can't understate the performances in the Planet of the Apes movies. I know it's easy to forget that these people are under all of these, uh, you know, all of the rendering, but at the end of the day, the emotions and the performances and the characters are all there, and I want to see Ben Affleck or whoever ends up playing Batman, because I am not convinced that Ben Affleck will be back, but that's a different story. Uh, I want. To you don't think he'll be back for the ba- for this Matt Reeves one? I, I think mean, he's contractually. I think he's he's got it. I'm not convinced, but okay. either way, right. uh, the point is that I want to see Matt Reeves working closely with an actor in it, playing Bruce Wayne in this way, um, and I want to see the visual style that complements that too. So I think this is incredible. All right, all right, Stephanie, what's next? Uh, all right, next story. Yes. Michelle Rodriguez threatens to leave Fast and the Furious franchise if female characters don't improve. Drama. All right. The Fast and Furious movies make a point to say how it's all about family, right? But if the recent comments made by franchise star Michelle Rodriguez are to be believed, the family is in jeopardy of splitting apart. Taking to her Instagram account to help promote the digital release of the latest installment of the series with The Fate of the Furious, Rodriguez shined a light on an issue she'd like to see resolved before she signs on for the next entry. And here's her quote. F8 is out digitally today. I hope they decide to show some love to the women of the franchise on the next one. 
or I just might have to say goodbye to a loved franchise. It's been a good ride, and I'm grateful for the opportunity the fans and studio have provided over the years. One love. Okay. Clark. Thoughts on this? Do you actually think Michelle would leave the franchise? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that she's been with the franchise for a really long time, and I think that her concerns are probably are valid. And um, and I think that you know we've seen in the last couple of uh, in the last movie specifically with Charlize Theron and Helen Mirren, like you know the franchise is is becoming aware that their fans are across the board fans across the world uh, and across genders and backgrounds and all kinds of things. So I think that it would be a very cool step in the right direction to have uh, some of the female characters sort of take uh, take a, I don't want to say the lead, because I think it's always probably going to be Vin's franchise, and now The Rock is obviously playing a, do you not agree? Oh, yeah. Well, that's kind of what I was hoping. Sorry, I didn't mean to make such a face. No, you, Perry made this <laughs> face, and I was like, oh, did I say that? something <laughs> blasphemous? <laughs> what did I do? Uh, but, but, yeah, I think, but I, I think that she's right to speak out, because she is a consistent part of this franchise, and she absolutely carries weight, and so I think it's good for her to speak out publicly, and hopefully, you know, uh, hopefully people will take her concerns into consideration. I think it's good that she spoke out publicly in a, in a sense, I think that there's certain things that I, she's she's been doing these type of things in general. So sometimes it's, it's just a matter of oh Michelle Rodriguez again. But I think the one thing though is she should I think she should have emphasized as far as maybe on the good guy side because the lead villain in the last movie right. was Charlie Theron. Sure. So and she had a pretty big role in that movie. But I understand what she's saying. I understand that she's there. It it does seem on the other side of things. It's just like the women for Vin Diesel and her else just kind of are in the background are there to kind of be like, oh, please, you know, come back to us, this, that. And, and, and But Michelle Rodriguez has had a couple good fight scenes and things of that nature. She's definitely, Letty's a tough character. But to put a little bit more in the forefront, maybe one of the stories revolves around her and Vin this time around. That's something I understand, too. Or maybe there's a different other character that comes back in. Maybe there's more to do with Jor Jordana Brewster. That side I get. I think that there's also a way to do it behind closed doors that you could have these kind of conversations. But then again, maybe she's tried that and maybe nothing has happened. So I just it, it's hard for me with her because she's done things in the past where she's been seen as difficult. So I don't necessarily know this is a difficult thing she's fighting for. I don't I don't at all, actually. But I think that, you know, it. it there's two sides of the story too, so maybe they have plans to to do it. Perry, what do you think? I feel like you reacted because my face is so much more expressive when half my face is. <laughs> like your, uh, your eyes just got so big, and I. Right. <laughs> well, the the reason why I reacted to that is because. I didn't really love the Fast 8 movie, but one of the things some folks were talking about that I did get really excited about is that maybe this could become The Rock and Jason Statham's franchise, and I think that would be a really great way to shake it up. It wouldn't, you know, ease uh, Michelle Rodriguez's worries at all, but I, I mean, I'm kind of with you on this, Christian. Even though I think this is something that we need to fight for to improve across the board, I think there's probably better ways to do it. And perhaps if this had come just, you know, out of the blue and nothing had come before it in terms of her reputation and also the whole thing last year with Vin Diesel and The Rock, which really put me off. And but then I not, think but that's not that was all fake um, and like a scandal. I mean it was, was they, it they, they were setting, that I'm not entirely they were setting stuff of. up. They were gonna originally do something for WrestleMania and it fell through. That okay, was all but to garbage. be fair, when you said Michelle Rodriguez has a reputation for him being difficult, hi Vin Diesel. One hundred percent. Hi. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah I, I I agree. If he would made the comments too, I would say the same thing sure. about him. So all this this stuff we're talking about I see this pop up on Instagram, and I'm like, whoa, don't put uh, a social media threat out there to leave the franchise. Do you also like how she's like, and the Blu-ray is out today. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. Kind of like, okay, probably well, one of the other reasons it's right. like a little strange. <laughs> Jeremy, but, oh, sorry. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's another question is, does this franchise need her character when it moves forward? And that just depends. I, I hope that they take the route that I think they should take, which is The Rock and Jason Statham, but at the same time, you know, even though we're kind of dismissing how she went about it, this is still a fight worth fighting. Sure. And yes, it had Charlize Theron, but we need a stronger female hero in this franchise. A hero, yeah, one, yeah absolutely. There haven't been any, uh, but I. They, There's I mean, memorable they, ones, but the villain, the villain, we've had a strong female villain. We haven't had any strong. Gal Gadot. Really, 
I, sure, right. but uh, she, she, but she, I think in the same thing, Gal Gadot had the same exact type of role that Michelle Rodriguez had. She was just kind of one. She was strong. She's a strong character, but she kind of blended into the background. She wasn't the lead of it. No, that is true. I just liked her in it. She was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I like the the fact that Clark brought up credit where credits due. You know, it's like this franchise started out. My knee jerk reaction when I heard this, I was like, this is a franchise about dudes growing out, but it's not. It started out that way about guys growing out with their cars and they have their arm candy. Now <laughs> the franchise has it turned into a heist franchise right. and then it's popcorn fun. But in that, it's like you have a larger audience now. So you, you do need to you need to adapt as your franchise is adapting. You can't just adapt one way and not adapt the other way. So I get where she's coming from. But again, like you said, Christian, and uh, you all said, where it's, I hope this wasn't step one. She was like, I need to start a conversation about this. <laughs> step one is Twitter. It's not, you know, you don't go on social right. media and do that. I hope she talked to her agent or manager and then studio execs and, the, and then was like, I'm not getting anywhere. Then you do something like this. So I hope it wasn't her neat here, like, all right. It's been uh, festering. Right, right. right and right. now I'm just going to explode. Like, don't do not do that as step one, because that just, it stand off. It doesn't actually get anything accomplished. doesn't get as much accomplished as you might want, rather than having a conversation. Right. To get people talking, though. Yeah, it does yeah. get people talking, for sure. But I, I, I feel like, I mean, she's been in this thing for Eight movies. Well, she was in seven. She was one. She wasn't. There in was or like. Something I like think that. there might have been two or three. She wasn't in, but because it, it, we they killed her off. Right. And then right. they, and then they, they brought her back. <laughs> yeah, and then when yeah. she says like, "Well, we need some," or how did she phrase it? Some changes, something like that. It's like I can't quantify what her sum is. Like, right. what does the studio need to do to make her happy? Because she didn't actually specify that. So hopefully they know. In the end, I just. I mean, I hope everyone's happy. I do think they're taking steps in the right directions. Like they had Charlize Theron and her. Maybe their plan all along was like, "Yeah, in the next one, we're going to have two or three more." You know, and we're going to blend and the franchise will go the way you wanted. Maybe this didn't need to happen. Maybe it did. I don't know. There's so much behind closed doors. All we have is her reaction. So it's like, wh what do you say? It's so funny. Like everything, whether it's content or the behind the scenes drama, Fast and Furious is turning into General Hospital and Days of Our Lives. It's such <laughs> a soap opera. It really it's is. Like, I heard myself when I, when, I, when I heard, when I heard the, well, then I heard myself say, well, she died. And then they brought her back. <laughs> and it's just like, it, it's, it really reminds me of like daytime television, but it's doing well. Yep. All right, Stephanie, we've got a bunch of movies that are opening this week in theaters. What are some of those movies? All right, first up, Despicable Me 3, yay minions. The mischievous minions hope that Gru will return to a life of crime after the new boss at the Anti-Villain League fires him. Instead, Gru decides to remain retired and travel to Fredonia to meet his long-lost twin brother for the first time. The reunited siblings soon find themselves in an uneasy alliance to take down the elusive Balthazar Brat, a former 1980s child star who seeks revenge against the world. Yes. And we have The House. Scott and Kate Johansson must figure out a way to earn some money after their daughter's scholarship falls through. When all else fails, the desperate couple join forces with their neighbor Frank to start an underground casino in his home. As the cash rolls in, Scott and Kate soon learn that they may have bitten off more than they can chew. All right, so that are the two movies that, are, that we're talking about this week, and I would... I, things that I've heard, ways that they have been screening these. I'm going to have to probably say that Despicable Me 3 is the one that you're going to want to see. I think for families, I think for the fact that I'm going to take my daughter to go see it this weekend and check that out if you're a fan of part one and two, if everyone gets very excited when you start talking about Minions. So I think that's the one that everyone's going to be seeing. Now, The House, even though the trailer might have been funny, um, and you have comedy superstars like Will Ferrell and Amy Poehler, it always makes me nervous when you reach out and say, hey, we'd love to see this so we can get some early reviews. Uh, yeah, we're not screening this for anybody. Uh, good luck. Mm -hmm. It's it, that, that usually means Stink Bomb City. Um, now, I hope that that's not the case. I hope that it's pretty funny. I hope it's a 2017 version of the Money Pit. That would be, uh, that would be fun. But I don't have much hope in this. I think that Will Ferrell, as much as I love him and one of my favorite Saturday Night Live characters of all time, I think he's pretty hit and miss with his movies. Um, there'll, there'll be some that he just knocks it out of the park, but I think there's others that could be something like this. I hope I'm wrong. I hope everybody comes back and says that's one of the funniest movies of the year. 
But Despicable Me 3 is the one that I think that most people are going to see this weekend. Am I wrong? Yeah, only if I hear reactions like that am I going to bother to go see the house because right. it, it, it is a concern when they're not screening the movie and I don't think it's tracking very well and I haven't actually found the trailers to be all that funny so it's not like I've been eagerly awaiting it and then it's like, oh, my screening invite didn't come in. It wasn't really top on my list anyway. I did see Despicable Me 3 though and you know it's not the greatest. I still think that that first movie was of a certain quality that the other movies couldn't match. Match, but if you have kids, like I know my little cousins love this franchise and they love the minions. And I think there's so much fun and creativity in this movie. It is not especially deep. So if you are an adult looking for a, you know, a Pixar level, I mean, I, I hate to throw that out there, but you know, Pixar does strike an emotional core in ways that most other animation studios do not. That is not what this is. But if you want kind of like a silly, fun, colorful romp type movie, I think it's well worth seeing. Clark, what do you got? Um, well, I actually will probably be seeing Baby Driver this weekend because uh -huh. um, so I haven't good. seen it yet. So I was supposed good. to see it on Tuesday, mm -hmm. but I was doing something with John Schnepp and it went long, so I didn't get to go. But, um, you know, I actually have never been a huge fan of the Despicable Me franchise, so it just was never my thing. And as far as the house goes, man, I'm like, yeah, Will Ferrell, Amy Poehler, Jason Manzukis, like the cast is so good um, that I want it to be great, but I, I don't, you know, like you guys have all said, if it, it doesn't doesn't sound if they're keeping it under wraps and these are two of the biggest comedy superstars in American right. cinema and t on television then it's not a good sign Jeremy I know you've seen Despicable Me 3 yes um, and the house again didn't get a chance to see it because they didn't screen it no but screen. are you gonna go check that one out uh, I got to check out the house because uh, the YouTube channel needs it needs its lifeblood my friend right, so right. this is where it comes from it comes from movies that are either great or horrible and if it's one of the two all right I got I got what I need uh, I'm with Clark on the Despicable Me movies. I remember the first time I saw this first Despicable Me movie, I put up a review and Christian texts me. It was like when we were first like, hey, right, dude, right. you do YouTube? 2010, YouTube. yeah. Yeah, and you text me and you're like, you have no soul. <laughs> so like, I was like, I don't know, it just kind of didn't grab me. You know? Me so, neither then. Right, so I mean... I, I know that about you. Though. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's this great. third movie especially, though, I, w I was kind of indifferent to. I thought the, the Red Band trailer to The House made me laugh because that scene where this dude gets his finger cut off and that guy does the greatest like mime gag where he's like, "Tell your friends the best with us." <laughs> I just, dude, I was dying because I love it when people gag mid sentence. It just makes me laugh. So, but you're right. When there are no screenings for a movie, that's <laughs> not it's, good. It's almost like the studio when you reach out, "Hey, do you have any, you have any, you have any screenings in the house?" They're like, "What's that?" Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> you, you'll have to be more specific. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, you're I talking need screenings about. to the house. Yes, here's Despicable Me three. Right. It's, it, it's it's so it's not looking good for the house. No. But uh, so if you had to pick one, Despicable Me 3, and like I said in my review, it's, it's a good pacifier. It's like, oh, you need to shut the kids up. Boop, there's yeah. a, there you go. Sit them down for about an hour and a half, two hours. You're good. Family night out. You're probably not going to get that with the house. <laughs> Less, lesson learned. Go see Baby Driver. Okay, now it is time for Buy or Sell. Pretty easy. We're just going to buy or sell topics. Stephanie's going to tell us a bunch of them. We're going to say if we like it, dislike it, and that's buy or sell. Makes sense, right? So let's get into it. All right. I really like this first topic. Uh, the Red Band trailer was just released for A Bad Mom's Christmas. I really like Bad Mom's one, so I like the story. <laughs> STX Entertainment has released the first Red Band trailer for A Bad Mom's Christmas. In the upcoming sequel, the underappreciated moms are fighting back against the pressures of the holiday season with their lives becoming even more stressful when their own mothers come to visit. The film opens November 3rd and stars Mila Kunis, Kristen Bell, Katherine Hahn, Jay Hernandez, Cheryl Hines, Peter Gallagher, Justin Hartley, David Walton, Christine Baranski, and Susan Sarandon, head of me. By any chance, would you buy or sell a bad mom's Christmas? Uh, first of all, I gotta say, hi, mom. I love you. Mm -hmm. I love every Christmas I had because of you. And Aww. this movie showed me that. It took me 30 something years, but now I appreciate. And that's what this movie, I mean, if you're gonna take a franchise and pump it out a year later, Harold and Kumar, that stuff, man, bring it to Christmas time. It always makes it fun, you know? Right. The Red Band trailer cracked me up. I didn't see Bad Moms 1, funny enough. It's just one of those ones that slipped under the cracks for me. It just, it happens once in a while. The Bad Moms 2, uh, the trailer made me laugh. It, uh, there, there's a line in there where well, with her mom is like, you don't get to experience joy. You <laughs> give joy. That's what being a mom is. I'm like, that sucks. But that's so the stigma. I feel like a lot of moms out there will appreciate the fact. It's like when I worked in retail management and I was like, 
I love the holidays, I do, but God, I hate the holidays. You know, like when you're in that thing that saps you for those months between Thanksgiving and New Year's, you can't help but just have a bit of disdain for it, which is why I had to sadly leave. <laughs> I had to gladly leave. So I, uh, I, I like this trailer. It cracked me up. I think the moms out there will like it, too. Hopefully it speaks to them. Clark? Yeah, it's a buy for me, too, actually, because I... Uh, so I didn't see the first Bad Moms movie. Um, I didn't love those trailers, so they weren't really appealing to me. But this one got a couple of giggles out of me as well, and I love the idea of bringing their moms in. The women that they have playing their moms, Christine Baranski, Cheryl Hines, and Susan Sarandon, is perfect casting. And I'm very excited to see, to see those three uh, involved. But also... Uh, it reminded me of a, a couple of years ago as I became an adult, my mom stopped putting up a Christmas tree. <laughs> and I remember being like, what, are, what is this? And she's like, oh, do you want to decorate it and then undecorate it and then get rid of it? And, I, and so she was like, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. And the fact that they had that in this trailer where Mila Kunis is like, I just didn't put up a tree this year. I was like, that's so real. <laughs> so, so with that being said, uh, I, I buy it. I'm actually very excited for this one. Perry. I had that same problem, but with a Hanukkah bush. Yeah, what <laughs> guess. Um, I'm actually really surprised you guys are buying it because I went into this thinking that having seen Bad Moms and liked it, that I was going to have to defend it because I was getting the sense that part of the reason I was having so much fun is because I like the three of them together a lot. I think that is what kept Bad Moms not just afloat, but made it connect with so many people where you just have so much fun hanging out with these three women and just experiencing their antics. But it wasn't laugh out loud funny but there were two moments in particular where I you know made some sort of like audible chuckle and one was Christine Baranski's line about mothers not getting joy but being there to give it because I, there's there's a weird sense of truth to that and then the other thing was when the little girl at the end was just oh like my oh gosh. my effing god because both lines it's the same thing it's that easily could have been super stupid and fallen flat but it's the delivery that makes it so funny so if they can achieve things like that throughout the whole movie I think this could be a well worthy sequel sequel that shockingly is coming out a little more than a year after the first film see I'm, I'm gonna buy the trailer because I think that what it, the trailer's job is to do is to get the audience that a it's intended for get everyone on board and people who the audience for this were people who liked a good comedy because it worked it, it was it was I think the budget was like 20 million dollars made like a, over 180 million dollars in, in domestically and it's a uh, it's or domestically or overall? Probably worldwide. overall. Worldwide, excuse me. I mean, 180 worldwide, and I think that you know that's that's a big accomplishment. The thing that scares me about it, and this doesn't have anything to do with the trailer, the fact that it's coming out so soon, um, and in general. Comedy sequels are very hard to make happen because it seems like it's just a retread of everything that has happened in the first movie, whether or not you put it in Christmas or not. It's they have to rely on the chemistry, they have to rely on the jokes. If they if they can do that again and recapture that chemistry that they had in the first movie, and it's not just a okay, well, Han was really funny this time, so let's get her times a hundred this times around, this time around. That's what I'm worried about. But the trailer itself, it's set up exactly what it's supposed to be. It's this holiday movie with this cast of characters that you enjoyed from the first film. It seems like that chemistry is there. It seems in tone with the same movie that was there the first time. So they're not psyched. It's not. It's very different than like Pitch Perfect to where they're now doing an action movie and jumping off yachts and explosions are happening. They're staying in tone to what they're staying on brand. And it, as long as that tra that's so that's why I'm buying the trailer because that's what it is. Um, but it's got some hurdles. A year that that's 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 fast. And whether or not they can make a, another comedy sequel successful, we'll see. Uh, Stephanie, did you get a chance to actually see the trailer? Uh, I saw bits and pieces of okay. it, and I just loved the first movie so much because that PTA mom thing is yeah. a real thing, you guys. <laughs> and the <laughs> right. fact that they think they're, you know, it's like the war is on between the working moms and the not working moms. So since it uh, pinpointed a lot of true things in the first movie, I feel like it really will pinpoint those Christmas angst that we all feel, you know? All right. Um, what's our next topic? All right. Next topic. Buy or sell the new trailer released for The Last Face starring Charlize Theron. Here's the summary. A new trailer has been released online for The Last Face. Set in war-torn regions of Africa, The Last Face stars Oscar winners Charlize Theron and Javier Bardem as a pair of doctors who, across treacherous landscapes in Sierra Leone, 
Sudan and Liberia begin a love affair as they clash over how to save lives and combat the dangerous conditions around them, all while maintaining, maintaining their relationship. The film is directed by Sean Penn and will be released in theaters and on demand on July 28th. Perry, buy or sell the trailer? I am going to sell it, but I should warn you, I have like negativity goggles. Can I make those a thing? When I went <laughs> into watching this trailer, one, because what happens when a new trailer comes out is that we get a press blast, an email that comes out, and oftentimes you'll get the synopsis with a poster on top. The first thing I saw, because the poster comes first, is the poster, and it looks like a poster for a straight-to-DVD mess. Mm. So then I went into it with that expectation. But also, even more harmful, is this movie played at Cannes in 2016, and I am a huge fan of Into the Wild, like many people are. So I was looking out for this one, and it just tanked, like, huh? tanked there. Really? Tanked hard. So since then, I've kind of been like, oh, where is this? pile of garbage are we ever going to get it and you know maybe it's, working title. maybe it's not fair for me to you know use the expectations that i have gotten from other people's reviews but it was overwhelmingly negative and you know i don't want to say that this trailer is just trash across the board but knowing what people were were trashing the movie about at the festival i could see those things in this trailer there are certain beats that i think play really well and other ones that feel feel like heartless and not genuine like the focus is on the wrong thing in the movie so I'm probably not going to wind up bothering to see this. Clark. Yeah, I'm going to sell it too. Honestly, this type of movie just doesn't really do it for me. The sweeping love story set against a war-torn place. Going and back to our point from before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so uh, so I, I'm going to sell it. Okay, I mean, I think that I, I'm going to buy it. And I, and I, because I haven't heard a lot of the reports and everything too. I do understand though, because it's, it's a very soft buy. Because I think that the trailer itself was a little disjointed. There were some times like there was one point they were selling you up because I'm primarily buying it because I'm such big fans of both Bardem and Theron. But there's one particular moment in it that it, like they set you up for this. Oh, that that that's what this story is going to be about. That person's going to die, and then he's, the person's in the next shot. Like it seems like after that happens, I'm like, oh, it's okay. So I know what, what happens, maybe, or if not, you've just kind of completely misled me in a different direction. But. I think because of where it, of who's in it, I'm curious if Sean Penn can put together something really good with these actors. He's a, he's a great actor. So to see what kind of performance he can get out of these actors, I'm curious, but I completely understand the cells. Uh, okay, Stephanie, so now Jeremy. actually, yes. What about Jeremy? Jeremy. Oh, okay. Well, um, <laughs> all right, so beforehand, here's what happened. Here's what yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Now I have to explain. Beforehand, I leaned over to Christian. And I was like, I didn't know this trailer dropped, so just go ahead and skip me. <laughs> No, it's okay. Uh, but I tried, tried but yeah, you I tried. tried. You, you tried your best. Threw me under the bus. You tried your best. You know, it, you they know, kicked Clark, me. Clark, they here's punched what me. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. Tweet Clark, about it now on social media. I'm you sorry. saw an injustice <laughs> in your eyes, and you said that cannot stand. Jeremy has a voice, and it must right. be heard. So and I appreciate about the that. I I'm thought the sorry. trailer. You know, I gotta agree with you guys. <laughs> I uh, tonally I'm speaking, sorry. it was kind of all over the place. And you know, what's funny though is I was really interested when Perry was talking. I was like, because a lot of times. It's just a trailer, and then that's that, you know? Perry's like, no, here's the inside information. Yeah. I was at Cannes. I was not at Cannes. Oh, where no, was I was I was scan so scouring the, the interwebs. I want to oh, go you, to Cannes. Oh, okay, okay, so you weren't at Cannes, but you were scouring the internet, and there was talk until there was nothing, yes. right? And that, that's just neat that you, <laughs> like, that's a perspective that we don't usually have for we trailers. We could have moved this on, recap. recap. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I didn't see the trailer. That's I'm all right. sorry, I didn't uh, know. All right. For your entertainment. All right, so if you want to ask Twitter questions about <laughs> movies that Jeremy hasn't seen or tra tra trailers he hasn't seen, please do so. We're going to take some Twitter questions. Stephanie's going to go through them. Make sure you send in the Twitter questions to Coll at Collider Video, and we're going to be going through some at the end of the show. But we also want to let you know we have a bunch of things that are happening on Collider Video. The first is Jedi Council. We're going to have a, one up a little later today, myself. Perry mm -hmm. will be on the show as well. Uh, Ash Cros Crosin, Crosin, God, I keep saying that name wrong, uh, will be back again. She was awesome last time. She's going to be on the show. Uh, new Schmodown. It's going to drop tomorrow, and it happens to have my buddy, my partner in crime, Mark Ellis, and he's going up against that lady right over there, Classy Clark Wolf. The polls, man, those polls. The, man. So it's a 72% Se right now. It's like 70-30. They, they, they have no faith in me. They have no me. faith, so we're going to have to see what happens between Clark Wolf and Mark Ellis. That goes down tomorrow. Uh, our non-spoiler review of Spider-Man Homecoming, that dropped this morning, so make sure you check that out. And 
one of the funny uh, uh, something that came out by the way this man on awesome tacular on verizon go 90 we actually dropped this on our youtube channel the blue apron the movie it is a trailer it's a fake trailer just to let you guys know that and it's up on the channel right now make sure you check that out and an all new episode of awesome tacular will come out tomorrow and a link to the newest episode is in today's show notes that's my that's my notes but it's in the description here so go check that out all right so now we're getting to mailbag and stephanie what did somebody write in that we're going to talk about right now all right first of all really fast yes the blue apron <laughs> did you get a chance to see the trailer <laughs> no but i'm gonna go you watch gotta it watch it right yeah. after this before you watch bad moms okay all, all right. right all right mailbag rocky drago writes yes. greetings collider clerk Greetings, Collider crew. It's been brought up many times when a comic book fatigue, when is comic book fatigue going to set in, even though it never happens? But do you think people are getting fatigued with comedies? So far this year, every comedy that has come out, First Fight, Chips, Going in Style, Baywatch, and Rough Night are all either under our audiences sick of generic comedies that they don't want to go anymore. Thanks for taking my question and bring on the filthy. I think it's a mixture of some of that stuff. Uh, first of all, it, let's just touch on comic book fatigue and, and, and just hopefully, it's not going to die, the, the, the question, but let's hope that it does because comic book movies, it's a genre now. Dramas aren't going to be fatigued. Yeah. Comedies will not be fatigued, and we'll get that into a second. And comic book movies, one of the things that they do, they throw in other other genres and put them in the comic book movies. So it, it's just, it's not. It's, it's a genre. The same way that Ant-Man is a heist film or Guardians is a space opera. Subgenre. So it, it, it's not, it, it's not going to die. It's a genre. But as far as comedies go, comedies are, will also not die. They are, all those movies you mentioned were garbage. Uh, they're not good. They're not good movies. And the good news is that people are hearing about them or they're not looking really good in the trailers, so people don't want to see them. Comedies in general, comedies do work. Perfect example of that, we just saw Spider-Man Homecoming last night. There's a perfect blend of comedy in that movie that fits in perfectly, really well with, with action. And it, and it does take a bit, like what I was just talking about, the, the John Hughes type comedy and the moments and the serious themes of you know uh, trying to find yourself as a kid. And, and, and they did that in that movie. And there's, there's other elements of comedy. Look, there's parts of War of the Planet of the Apes that have really good comedy. Comedy in general, will not die. Now, these overall themes, these types of movies, these silly slapstick movies, you can make them work. Now, whether or not we're going to get a young Frankenstein anytime soon is probably unlikely, but there are movies that can work. There are comedies that work. 21 Jump Street, 22 Jump Street proved that good comedies, people will go see them. It's this tired genre and the silly, like, I think when you dumb it down too much that people are going to get tired of it. What do you think? Yeah, I think... Writing comedy in is comedy has got to be one of the hardest things, hardest genres to write and stick the landing on after production. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. write, film, and and edit. It, like all three of those things will make a good comedy work. I agree with Christian. It's like comic book fatigue. Comic book movies are a genre. Absolutely. If blockbuster was still around, it would have hey comic book movies rather than action movies. They they are they are a thing that they're not going to go away anytime soon. Neither is comedy because you couldn't live in a world without the comedy genre. Uh, but I hope that they studios start getting wiser and start making good comedies rather than making comedies that you don't give screenings to, hoping that it blows right under the right under the rug, like uh, what it looks like they're doing with the house. So. Will it go away? No. Are people getting fatigued? No, they just don't like crap. So don't make crap. Okay. Just because it was brought up with comic book fatigue, fatigue. Holy crap, 2017 for comic book adaptations. Yeah. I just like maybe it's because I'm still on my Spider-Man Homecoming high, but look at the exceptional movies we've gotten this year in this genre. So I definitely don't see that fatigue question coming up with comic book adaptations anytime soon because of exactly what you guys said. They are crushing it in that department where it is, it's holding, to, holding true to what people want to see in those types of movies, but they're starting to spice them up in really interesting and somewhat unexpected ways too. And I'm really excited for everything that we could wind up seeing because of that. Comedies this year is just a problem and I don't think it's gonna stop being a problem. Every comedy I've seen this year, I didn't like. That movie behind me, I was really excited for it. I didn't like it. I didn't yeah. like it at all. And just looking forward, other than uh, other than Bad Mom's Christmas, I mean, right. there really isn't anything, or at least nothing from my brief scan that I can come up with that I'm thinking, 
like that's the comedy hit of the year. If anything, it's it's things like uh, Logan Lucky, you know, genre mashup type stuff. I think that's where we're again gonna get our best comedy this year, just like Spider Man Homecoming and a couple moments in War from the Planet of the Apes. So comedy is not going anywhere anytime soon, but this is definitely not a good year for it. Clark. Yeah, I mean, comedy is a, you know, it's not going anywhere. And uh, hopefully, you know, the, the people who are making it uh, are going to really start working on. Well, for how about the big sick? You know, right. everybody uh, is right. saying the big call. sick is out this weekend. I'm super bummed that I haven't gotten to see it yet. But I've heard so many people saying not only is it laugh out loud hilarious, but it's insanely heartfelt. That's a Judd Apatow produced uh, film. And I was listening uh, to something the other day where they said the Judd and Emily and Kumail uh, worked on that script for three years yeah. before they actually went into production. So it's out there. You just got to keep your eyes out for it, you right. know? Um, so yeah, but it's, it's comedy's not going anywhere. It's probably worth pointing out that my brief scan only included wide releases. Sure, so sure. Yeah, and, and, this is a perfect but, example yeah. of things not keep to keep your eye out for the big sick because mm -hmm. it isn't, it didn't get a rough night right. kind of release. It didn't get a probably chips should've. kind of release, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And hopefully word of mouth is being so good and, uh, and it's making money in those three theaters mm -hmm. that it's in right now or those advanced screenings. So go find it. Go seek it out and support comedy that's actually funny. All right. So we have a cut. We have a little time left for a couple Twitter questions uh, that you guys have been tweeting out. Stephanie, what are they asking? Feed is blowing up, you guys. Uh, okay. Christopher Corcoran writes, could Paramount cancel the Bumblebee movie if Transformers 5 ultimately makes less than last year? Uh, no. Not at all, because like we talked about, you got to remember that you're talking about because it made less domestically. Um, it crushed overseas. It's already made like over $300 million. And so whether or not they make another Transformers movie with Michael Bay down that line, that's another conversation to be had because maybe they want to start attacking, uh, going after the U.S. audience. You've got a director now in Travis Knight who did Kubo and Two Strings. This is a nice experiment for them to see what's going to happen finally with another director in the Transformers franchise. Granted, it's a different movie than the, the actual... Transformers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever it is, but it, this is a spin-off movie. They're going to explore it. They're going to see what Travis Knight can do. I don't think there's, there's no chance they cancel it. Clark? Nope. They're not canceling it. <laughs> Perry? <laughs> I, I don't think they're canceling it either, but I think that uh, this movie has something like 278 worldwide right now, okay. and it's well, it's not cracking a billion, and I think no, that that's what they expect with these types of things. So, you know, maybe they'll pull the reins to a degree if they continue on with a Transformers 6, but I want to see that Bumblebee movie, even though I didn't like the last night. It's true. I want to see a new direction. A uh, Bumblebee movie would be the way to go. I could see them slicing the budget maybe a little bit, maybe opening it elsewhere rather than the U.S. first, like a week uh, early in Europe. Who knows? But I don't think it's going away. All right, let's do two more. All right, Joseph Thomas Four wants to know, which film do you think has suffered more from production issues? Ben Affleck's Batman film or the Han Solo film? Oh, Han, Han Solo. Solo. Han Solo film. Yeah, hands Ooh. down. Because I, Ben Affleck's, the Batman movie has, has benefited because Affleck now can, you know, t kick back a little bit, be able to collaborate with someone like Matt Reeves. It, from what we were talking about before, it looks like we're all on the same page with what was going on as far as tone. Um, Han Solo right now, we haven't seen anything. We're hearing it could be potentially an Ace Ventura movie. There's, there's acting lessons on, on set. There's, we, there's, there's fights. There's all this stuff. They're, they might move the date. It's, it's Han Solo. Han Solo's in trouble right now. Perry? Yeah, I mean, look at when that problem happened, too. It's a big difference when something happens during development compared to three weeks before you're supposed yep. to wrap principal photography. It, I, I've said it before, and I have to say it again. It's an impossible situation to sugarcoat. I'm rooting for them to come out with a great movie, but this this is unusual. Yeah, uh, a Han Solo is absolutely interesting. I've never felt that before. I've never looked at a Star Wars movie and been like, this really is the movie that... I've humored in my mind if it would be best for the studio to come out and be like, we can't Pull actually... Pull plug, right? Right. Yeah. Like, if, if, if they came out and said, we can't make Han Solo look and feel like Han Solo, I'm sorry, we're either starting over or it's not happening, I would give all the props in the world to them and be like, you clearly care about the character and the property. So, I mean, that'd be props in the eyes of the fans, though it would cost them millions of dollars. It's a mess. Clark? Yeah, I agree with you, Jeremy. I mean, I think that it, that... It, they. It would really say something if they said, you know what, we're starting over. And okay, start over. Make mm -hmm. the best movie that you can. Um, with the Batman, you know, I'm glad the DCEU went, nope, 
hold on, mm. everybody, hold on. We're not going to rush this into production. We're not going to force a team of creatives to do something they're not prepared to do, they're not ready to do. Let's stop. Let's take a minute. Let's work this out a little bit more. Let's find the right director for the job. Let's make sure that Ben Affleck is ready to go, even though I don't think he's going to do it, and and all of those things. And, uh, yeah, so so the Han Solo movie, uh, you know, uh, that's that's crazy what's going on. And I, the Ace Ventura thing, Such you keep saying it, and it's, there's, there's no way, there is no way that Miller and Lord turned Han Solo into Ace Ventura. <laughs> it was more of like a, the fact, it's, it was more of like slapstick stuff, and I, I think that if, Maybe slap, not the whole tone, but slap jokes and the way they were playing it. Look, something went wrong. Something stinks. <laughs> and whether or not it Christian was, and I are going to fight this out one of these days. Great and question. that's chilling. <laughs> right. Well, great it is question. really interesting when we compare how the DCEU is shaping up compared to Star Wars because a couple months ago, everybody was on opposite sides. And look how things can change. I mean, this is the creative collaboration process. And even though something might seem like it's in one heck of a rut right now, yeah. you kind of never know how things are going to shift. It could World War Z it. We'll see. All right, last one. Last one from Chemi No Surfy says, Hi, guys. Honestly, how many of the Spider-Man spinoffs do you think we are actually going to want to watch? Oh. I only see Venom working. Well, oh, interesting. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, the thing about it is, all right, so you now have these Spider-Man spinoffs that are Spider-Man villains with no real Spider-Man to fight them, or they're announcing the villains for when they get Spider-Man back into their universe so Spider-Man can fight them. Um, I, I, Venom is definitely one. Like, that's one that I do want to watch. I love the characters Craven the Hunter, and I love the character Mysterio. It's funny, Cobster and I were talking about it last night. It's like, Mysterio is one of those weird villains. It's like, I'd love to see what he could do, because he could just, like, make visual effects. People are like, the room's melting, but it's not. You know, you could do some really cool stuff with that. I genuinely want to see all of them. Uh, I don't know how Black Cat can work without Spider. Like, it, you know what I mean? There's like a dynamic there that I, I, I don't see working more more than Quentin Beck, who was Mysterio, and uh, Craven the Hunter. I'm more on the Venom for sure. And then the villain's kind of half. Is this is this what we want to see or what we will likely no, see? No, so what, yeah. What do you think we're likely going to see? Oh, likely going to see. Yeah. I think oh, we Venom. we are pretty much going to see Venom and Black and Silver, just given how far along they are right. with uh, with development and prep, because they got the, uh, Black and Silver as a director, mm -hmm. Venom has a star. I think those are going to happen, but. I kind of wish, after having seen Homecoming, why can't Marvel and Sony just continue to play nice together <laughs> right, right. and make movies together? I mean, Sony. Well, gets they will. All... They're just not standalone. The uh, standalone yeah, universe. No, I know. Right. But yeah. Sony still gets all the the box office money. Why can't they just strike a deal to make more movies in the MCU? I'm just so happy with how Spider-Man: Homecoming yeah. came out. I don't want to see them risk it, even though they could make a great Venom movie. For all I know. What do you think, Clark? I think it's just going to be Venom. I think depending if Venom sees the light of day, which again, I'm very skeptical. Uh, that this is actually going to happen. I know Tom Hardy's attached, but Tom Hardy, you know, he was attached to a friend of mine's superhero movie a few years ago, and that never got off the ground. And I understand that Venom and Sony are very different, right. but I, I'm not convinced that the cameras will roll on Venom. I think it'll roll. I think it'll roll on Venom. I think that that's going to be the, very similar to what we were just talking about with Bumblebee. I think it'll be their experiment, and I think that that's where you're going to see whether or not how likely it is if it doesn't do well and it, and it bombs um there might be some kind of deal with with marvel it's just like all right, go and try to do your thing and if sh like a labyrinth quote should you need us uh and you know we'll, we'll see what happens as it moves forward but i think that they need to be very careful on how they they push out their standalone movies especially after the fact that what it seems like homecoming is going to go over very well with audiences you have restored faith in the spider-man character uh, as far as being in a movie so you want to be careful of who you know he's not in the movies but it's still p part of the universe so well maybe not mcu we don't know the whole thing is kind of uh, is kind of we uh, might have a video explaining that coming soon we are going to have a video explaining that. that's absolutely true so there's a lot of stuff happening on twitter it's on twitter yeah you guys yes a whole bunch of stuff but a lot of stuff <laughs> in general on collider video i mentioned all the stuff but you guys thank you so much for joining us today that is our show i'd like to thank everybody who joined me today first clark wolf where can they find you thank you you can find me at clark wolf clark with an e wolf with an e thank you guys so much for having me today and you can find me battling mark ellis on the schmodown oh, yeah. tomorrow even though all of you jerk faces are counting <laughs> 
punching me out. That's Come right. on. And I'm going to put up a good fight. I think that you will. And Perry Nemiroff, where can I find you? I have all the faith in the world. <laughs> you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. And of course, look out for Collider Behind the Scenes this Saturday, 2 p.m. PST. The beer pong tournament continues. Talking about someone who's going to be doing Schmodown next Friday, July 7th. This man goes for his shot against Hector Navarro for the Inner Geekdom Championship. But Jeremy Johns, where can they find you? You can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Twitter, rest of the internet. You can find my show, Awesome Tacular, on Go90, where Christian and I talk Star Wars stuff. We do a lot of fun stuff. We even did, yes, like you mentioned, a Blue Apron trailer for a fake trailer for a fake movie that doesn't exist. And it's not a sponsorship. <laughs> we did it for the fuck of it. <laughs> that is absolutely right. And Stephanie Gray joining us today. Thank you again. Yay. Where can the good kids find you? Uh, Twitter and Instagram at Stephanie L. Gray. Uh, Busker, the live streaming app. I'm on there all the time. And Holly Scoop. It's a YouTube channel. I host for them. Nice. Oh, and for Thank me, you, you for having me, by the way. Of course. Thanks real. for joining Thank us. You. Absolutely. Fun. For me, you can find me at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. Also, check out Schmoes Noah on Stardust. That's a lot of fun, too, like trailer reactions and stuff. We started using that app. Go over there. And that's it. We'll see you guys, Jedi Council, a little bit. And again, I mentioned, I forgot to mention Heroes. So Heroes is going to be doing something starting July 11th. We're going to be doing these fun kind of mini 20-minute episodes every day. John Schnepp and the crew, Monday through Friday, talking Heroes. It's going to be a lot of fun. Join us. Thanks again, guys, and we'll catch you tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.